The governor of Kaduna State, Nasir El Rufai, has said that Nigeria's next president in 2023 should emerge from the southern part of the country. Uh, the governor made this statement in an interview over the weekend with BBC House of Service. It comes amid controversy over the propriety of rotational presidency between the North and the South, and Mamadou Dara's assertion that marriage should determine who becomes president instead of zoning. El Rufai expresses personal opinion on what has become a divisive subject, Submit, dismissing insinuations that he's interested in the race. There's been many sides to this. Uh, I just want well, to start from you this morning. We've had many sides to this. I mean, what's your take on this? Looking up to 2023. Well, it's been naive for anybody to think that the race for the 2023 presidency has not started. Hmm. It has in earnest. Uh, even though we are just one year into a new uh, dispensation, a new administration for the uh, Buhari administration's second term. Um, Governor Erufai coming out to clear, clear the air that he's not interested in the presidency is interesting because political watchers had just months ago fingered himself and a governor from the southwest as, you know, potential uh, candidates and running mate for the 2023 presidency as would be pushed for by the ruling party, the APC. But the issue of zoning, you know, and rotational powers, some would say perhaps, uh, are we not overflogging this issue? Mm. Uh, we know the things to be done. We know how to do them. We are just running in circles. If zoning and rotational powers have not um, produced, uh, you know, the yearnings and aspirations of some parts of the country, why are we still running it? Why not go for the alternative of a restructuring that some will say, you know, that's the silver bullet, really, to ensure that everybody controls what they have, you know, and also have equal share at the table. So I don't know. It's beginning to sound like, you know, a broken record. Well, I mean, I think uh, this is uh, all very useful uh, because the debate is about where should power go, how should Nigerians share power, uh, what should be the immediate future of uh, Nigeria in terms of power at the centre? So um, it's healthy for people to express their opinions, whether it's Nasir Rufai or any other person, uh, Alaji Tanko Yakasai or anybody. Uh, so at, that, at, at the level of uh, free speech, oh. I think that's fine. Uh, but the other thing again to note is that the battle for the presidency of Nigeria uh, it's a permanent uh, struggle. <laughs> As one election is uh, ending, people are already positioning themselves uh, for the immediate future. And the opinions that have been expressed about power shift or competence or whatever, um, it's on both sides. There are northerners who say, look, power should shift to the south, like uh, uh, Governor Rufai. Nasir Rufai. There are others who say, look, uh, there should be competence, uh, you know, uh, like... Um, uh, what's his name again? Uh, Mamandaura. 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 Mama mm -hmm. And there are others in the South who say, look, let's not even talk about power shift. Let us start with restructuring. Yes. Because Nigeria needs to be restructured before you can have the kind of efficiency or effectiveness uh, that the Nigerian people uh, expect. Now, in the case of what uh, Governor Erufai has said, uh, there have been reactions. Afeni Fere, for example, says that he's been deceptive. Yinka Udumakin says he's just... Uh, you know, uh, trying to use a bait uh, to deceive the people of the, of the South. The one major unresolved matter, of course, is that, look, Nigeria ought to be run in a way that every group, every ethnic group, every zone will have a sense of belonging, will have a sense that there is justice, there is equity. Now, we've been talking a lot about the Southeast, uh, and, you know, the uh, people of the Southeast, they say, yes, it should come their way. And there are persons who have also said, look, nobody is going to offer uh, the presidency of Nigeria on a platter of gold uh, to the people of the East. They will have to form bridges and alliances because what we have seen with the pattern of elections in Nigeria is that we all need each other. Mm. You know, the South needs the uh, North. The North needs the South. And it's not possible for just one region to go alone mm. because we need the backup, yes. you know, of uh, other stakeholders within Nigeria. But as I said, uh, it's nothing to be emotional about. Yeah. It's just to realize that uh, there are unresolved issues. We are yeah. not yet like other countries where you can come from any, anywhere. 
there is diversity, there is multiculturalism, and these are sensitive points uh, in the Nigerian arrangement that we must always be conscious of. I mean, we're looking forward to that day where you can come from anywhere and uh, run for elections in this country and be president. I mean, just like the last American elections, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were both from New York, <laughs> and they were both running for and, presidency. And it didn't matter. And it didn't matter. They were both from New York. Uh, a former Nigerian Minister of Petroleum Resources, uh, Daisy Ali Alice Maduke, has lamented how values are fast eroding in the society. The minister who made her views known at a virtual conference organized by the Ijo uh, Nation Development Group, the umbrella body of the Ijo Cultural Association, said that things had degenerated to the extent that frosters, better known as Yahoo Yahoo Boys, are the ones being respected in society. She highlighted the importance of mentorship for young people, saying that only hard work could guarantee success. According to Mrs. Alice Madoke, quote, the ones that have the swag, the Yahoo Yahoo boys, as my son will say, these, in short, are the role models that they are looking at. These are the ones that reinforce negative societal norms and values. This is a travesty of an unfolding tragedy for us. Why I have spent time talking about fatherless homes and the impact it has on our children. The truth of the matter is that an irresponsible boy tends to become an irresponsible man, and it is therefore a vicious cycle. And if you plant, yeah, you cannot harvest plantain. The ex-minister had relocated to London shortly before President Goodluck Jonathan handed over to President Muhammad Buhari in 2015. Alison Maduke pointing out what is happening in the society. Okay, Dr. Mati, I'll go first with you okay. in this regard. Well, I mean, one of the major problems that we have in Nigeria is the erosion of the value system. Yeah. And what uh, uh, Mrs. Alison Maduke has done in that uh, uh, virtual conference is to draw attention uh, to the need for values, and the need for us to address the erosion of values, normative values, moral values uh, within our community. The effect of that is that we now have an invited, uh, you know, moral uh, paradigm across uh, Nigeria. Once upon a time in this country, if you were a civil servant and you were found to be living above your means, you get a query mm. under the public service rules. But who still gives a civil servant query now? Mm. Uh, you find many civil servants who live above their means, and it seems that that is uh, perfectly uh, normal. Once upon a time in this country, it was not like that. Once upon a time in this same country, uh, if you were a young man and you don't have any known means of livelihood, the neighbors will be concerned, the community will be concerned, mm. the parents will also worry, because they will just conclude that if you don't have a, vis a, a, a known means of livelihood, then you must be into some criminal Mm. Uh, activity. And it was also once upon a time in this country that parents used to tell their children when they were going to school, say, remember the son or the daughter of, of whom you are. are. I'm not too sure that many parents are still saying that. So Alice Madweke, uh, you know, uh, is drawing our attention to the need to return to that level because, as is, she says, we are now in the age of uh, Yahoo Yahoo. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the new role models are uh, Hush Puppy, mm. uh, Woodbury, mm. and you need to just measure that by the uh, large number of people that follow them mm. on social media because mm. these are the new role models. Every young man wants to uh, ride a big car and uh, nobody wants to put in the hard work. So the values she's talking about are perfectly in order, about hard work, mm. about commitment, about consistency. And it was good to see her uh, getting her groove back, mm -hmm. you know, because I saw the video and I said, well, you know, this is the, uh, you know, Mrs. Alice Madweke that we all know. Uh, very articulate as usual, of course. Great. That is why you've got uh, about a 10 seconds. Yes, I think we must this. also, just to add to that, I think Dr. Abati said it perfectly well, but we'll, we must also have leaders lead by example. Mm. There's a syndrome of get rich quick, mm. and that's because the young people see those in power who are not, you know, providing the basic amenities they need, mm. riding the flashy cars and living the flashy lives, and they wonder what's in there for us. Mm. If our leaders are not going to lead by example, then we'll take the other route. So we must have leaders who lead by example, and we must also go back to the roots, the root causes of all of this, which is our value system being eroded. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll, well, that's all we can take on it, guys. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rotus, Michael, and Aaron to give us updates on Africa, global business, and COVID-19. Stay with us. All right, welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News. Uh, Dr. Joining us now is Rotus Odiri with Africa Business Update. Good morning, Rotus, and over to you.
Good morning, uh, Doctor. Good morning, Adiswa, and good morning, Rufai. Uh, we uh, begin with uh, President Buhari, who has uh, signed uh, the Companies and Allied Matters Act. This is the amended Companies and Allied Matters Act for uh, 2020. Uh, this is, of course, uh, an update on the initial act from 1990. So it's taken about uh, 30 years uh, for, this to, uh, for, this to, for this moment to arrive. SMEs, as we all know, are the backbone of uh, the engine, engine backbone, pick your, your adjective, of this uh, economy. And so it was very important that in an, in an effort to drive the ease of doing business uh, initiatives that this president has tried, to, has tried to push forward, that this act uh, was signed. Uh, so if we take a look at the uh, COVID cover here with regards to what uh, announcement that was made, this new comma is, you know, I said COVID cover, comma cover. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this new comma is a uh, Nigeria's most significant business legislation in three decades, and it introduces new provisions that promote ease of doing business and reduce regulatory hurdles. So we can take a look at just a few of them, just a short summary here. A single person now can start a private business. Before, you need to have about two or three people. Now you just need only, only one person. Um, company secretaries are now optional, although this is for private companies. For, publicly trade, for public companies, they are still mandatory. Your AGMs, annual general meetings, um, they are now virtual. And COVID-19 had a role to play here to where you no longer have to have a physical, um, um, physical gathering in order to have your annual general meeting. And though there have also been provisions for electronic filing as well, where copies of uh, electronic uh, of, of documents can now be accepted you know, for evidence, if it's for litigation or filing of docs and so on and so forth. Um, there's a number of other provisions that are also there, but I just wanted to quickly summarize uh, just a few of them. So you know, let's, you know, let's not forget, though, you know, 40% to 60% of overhead costs for SMEs in this country are power related. Well, of course, there's the Siemens um, electrification drive that has agreements, which is now moving forward, you know, to provide 25,000 megawatts by 2025 in phase three of that agreement. So that's still there. But this is supposed to at least make things easier um, for businesses to get off the ground. And this is a, this is a welcome development from the, uh, from the presidency. Our uh, next story is on the World Bank. This is news that broke on Friday. Uh, we actually broke this first uh, on, for, for the world to, to see. The World Bank approved $114 million for Nigeria to help fight COVID-19. Um, this $100 million is that is coming from the International Development Association. They were established in 1960 for, uh, for initiatives like this. The remaining $14.2 million is a grant from the Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility. Now, there's the um, COPREP, which is the COVID-19 Preparedness and Response Project. They will provide grants to additional grants to the 36 states plus the FCT. We've also got a quote here from uh, the country uh, director, Mr. Shubham Chaudhry, uh, World Bank country director for Nigeria. He said, Nigeria has ramped up its efforts to contain COVID-19 outbreak, but more needs to be done at the state level. The project will provide the states with much needed direct technical and fiscal support to strengthen their position in combating COVID-19. So again, remember on Friday, we had our special package where we notified the public about COVID-19 and the efforts that they were making in feeding 1.7 million households across the country, which amounts to about 10 million people. So you add that COVID announcement on Friday on top of the World Bank um, COVID-19 uh, assistance of $114 million on Friday as well. And you can say that Nigeria has received you know, a significant boost with trying to fight COVID-19. The efforts still have to continue, but this was um, uh, very good news in that regard. Uh, next up is AXA Mansard. Um, we're looking at uh, the uh, pension subsidiary of AXA Mansard. This is, a lot of news came over through the weekend. I think they made this announcement of late Friday. Um, they are basically divesting from their pension subsidiary. Um, this approved shareholder reprove, approval on the 13th of February at their, uh, at their meeting. Um, Eustatia Limited has emerged as the preferred bidder. Eustatia is a member of the Verod Group. Verod, of course, Verod Capital is a private equity company. Um, so basically, this is how it's going to break down. The shares acquired 60% of the majority shareholdings held by AXA Mansard. That is in their pension subsidiary. 40% will be acquired from the minority shareholders. The financial advisors was Rand Merchant Bank. Legal advisors are 
Luka and uh, Oyebode. If you add, take this in addition to the news that we broke here as well, where FCMB also taking over the uh, pension subsidiary, subsidiary of ICO Insurance, you can see that there is a move, a, a move being made here to acquire more pension assets to see that assets under management, as far as pensions are concerned, which are about 10.1, 10.2 trillion naira right now, they're still growing. There's still room to grow. So you can see a number of different companies taking you know, positions and positioning themselves to try to get a hold of, uh, of the pension space. There's only about 9 million or so Nigerians that have RSAs, that's retirement savings accounts. So there's still a lot of room to grow. Of course, with COVID-19, salary cuts, job losses, people being furloughed, there will probably have been, you know, the, there's been an impact, a negative impact of how much has been put into RSAs this year. But not, that notwithstanding, you can still see companies making strategic moves to acquire you know, pension funds in order to move forward and gather that market share, which looks um, pretty, uh, pretty promising. Um, our next story after the, uh, uh, the, after the uh, pension issues, well, this is not really much yet to, to, to talk about. The central bank updated their exchange rates on their website um, to 379. So if you go to <coughs> cbn.gov.ng, you'll see that. Remember back on July the 8th, we talked about um, FMDQ um, updating the official rate to about 381. Uh, the INE window is about 388. So, uh, you know, I mean, this is just an update. Not really, you know, not really sure how many can actually access this at 379 because, again, the, the other rates are higher and, uh, and uh, what's it called? The um, parallel market rate is about 470, 485. We still have an you know, FX liquidity issue, which the central bank says they will address. But this, again, um, I believe they're probably still moving towards an FX unification. So that's my understanding of what is being, is being done here with regards to the rates being updated. It was 360 as at last count. And finally, um, South African uh, Airways, the banks um, in South Africa that were be approached by the finance ministry, at, uh, finance minister Tito Mboweni, to fund the bailout of South African Airways, none of them bit. None of them, you know, put forward any money to try to bail out the airways. So they, right now, things are stuck in limbo with regards to any support moving forward for a bailout for South African Airways. South African Airways has not made a profit since 2011 and has received bailout after bailout after bailout for the nice nine, last nine years. With how COVID-19 has affected things in South Africa, the bank's um, appetite for, to try to support the company is, uh, is, is tepid at best, okay. so, or lukewarm, rather. And that's our African business update. Okay, Rotus, thank, thank you so much for that. I just want to talk about you know, companies buying pension funds and the likes. And uh, you said oh, that's current, we have currently 9 million people with RSA accounts. I just want to ask, how can these companies turn it around? Let's not forget, we have a sizable unemployment rate in this country, you know. Uh, underemployment and unemployment itself, cumulatively, it goes into the percentiles of the 40% upward. And also, recently in the papers, they're talking about 22 million SMEs out of the close to 40 million SMEs we have struggling to breathe as a result of the COVID-19. So how are these pension funds going to increase that RSA number from 9 million to even more? Well, What's so it going to be like? Yeah, I mean, look, again, the challenges are there. The pension, pension, the PENCOM, that's the regulator, also has uh, a micro-pension scheme, which is supposed to be for the informal sector and for SMEs. So that is growing gradually. So PENCOM has already addressed that to try to increase the pool to account for the informal sector and SMEs. But for the you know, formal employment, with the challenges that COVID-19 has prevented, presented with um, you know, people's employment being affected, it's going to be difficult to try to you know, have more contributions made towards those RSA accounts. But again, these companies are forward-looking in that, okay, 2021, 2022, things get better. They'll be able to galvanize and add more people to the pool. The unemployment rate, by the way, is about 20%. But that's as of Q3 2018. Your 40% estimates, I've seen those estimates. We don't have official numbers yet. But as of Q3 no, 2018... No, I'm, I'm saying, I, I, said, I said that was my estimate for underemployment and unemployment. Okay, uh, okay, Rutus, fine. we don't have uh, more time again. Uh, but I would have loved to ask you about the reaction of stakeholders uh, to the... Uh, Kama. To Kama. It's been positive. Uh, it's been positive. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I'm moving on now to more business update. Let's join Michael Wilson from London. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Uh, I'll take you through uh, Asian stocks such as they are beginning the week and uh, moving really in, in tight ranges. The usual worries about the uh, 
political conflict between the United States and, and China, um, weighing a lot on sentiment there. And investors are closely watching indications of further U.S. sanctions on China. Um, I'll give you details of those when I have them. Nothing at the moment. Um, China's uh, factory deflation sounds very technical, but uh, deflation is, is prices going down, which you don't actually want. Um, that eased in July. That was driven by a rise in global oil prices and so on. Um, but what's being... Now, th this this is a, a, an interesting one. I, this People here are saying this is a sign of things to come. The, the Hong Kong business tycoon, tycoon Jimmy Lai uh, was today arrested and his newspaper's uh, offices were raided uh, over allegations of collusion with foreign forces. That's under the controversial um, new security law imposed by China. And he had been a prominent or is a prominent pro-democracy voice and he was later granted police bail. But that's, a, that's an unpleasant move there. Let me recap what happened last week because it was quite an important one and a lot of this detail will carry forward in, into this week. First of all, um, as far as the United States is concerned, I think most people agreed that we're looking towards the start of a recovery uh, there. It hasn't been, I know there's been a lockdown in various other states, but generally speaking, and I'll come on to the detail of it, um, the, it the things are getting slightly better there. And those better than weekly expected, uh, the expected weekly jobless claims and the well-received July uh, payroll uh, report pointed to um, a renew, a renew, a, a, re a renewable uh, and uh, renewed uh, economic uh, activity, and that pushed equity markets in the United States up um, for uh, a, 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 a another week. And actually, what was particularly encouraging was a fall in the unemployment rate there to 10.2 percent. Again, a huge, but you know, given the problems that we have, not too bad. And if you drill down into these figures, though. What you find is there's a lot of people actually coming back to work in things like retail and restaurants, given that some of the lockdowns are being eased. The big concern is this business about the six hundred uh, dollar unemployment benefit, you know, the stimulus scheme, which is still not been uh, agreed in the United States at the moment. More on that in a sec. Um, but there could be a fresh spike in claims as newly furloughed workers um, actually have go back after having gone to work and so on. So it's very, very difficult. That US stimulus package has still not been agreed. And the, it, it, I find it terribly strange, I don't know about you, that US politicians don't understand that when they actually are going to go to the polls in November, which is not that far away, I know I keep, I keep banging on about this, but they're not going to have a very... If they are not seen as trying to do something and just argue their political case, I don't see it going down very well with the voters. And President President Trump himself, he said he would, and he has signed a number of executive, uh, executive orders, four of them, um, about unemployment benefits, a temporary payroll tax deferral, eviction protection, and student loan relief. He's already passed those. And Steve, Secretary, um, Treasury Secretary Steve Munchen said he now would listen to any proposal uh, from the Democrats. And Nancy Pelosi, who is the Speaker of the House there, says she hopes that talks will reopen. Um, President Trump's decision to end last week about banning TikTok and the rest of it, WeChat, we did that one. Uh, but look out for um, a Twitter counter offer, possibly for TikTok. That's the kind of whisper I'm hearing uh, this morning. The US president also announced a series of sanctions against some Chinese officials. So against all this, then, it looks like the European markets will start rel relatively uh, positively this morning when they actually get underway. I'll just briefly skip through the week ahead because it's quite quite a busy one. UK, Q Q quarter two GDP, um, manufacturing output, that's on Wednesday. We'll see what damage has been done. Not optimistic about those kind of things but we have to be realistic. And UK unemployment, again, these figures are very, very difficult to understand, basically, because we don't know at what stage we are in the unemployment cycle. We're still feeling our way forward with um, a, a white stick in many kind of ways. We get retail sales in the United States. That's on Friday. And we saw some encouraging signs for that last week, uh, last month, rather. And finally, finally, um, we're going to get uh, the U.S. weekly jobless claims, obviously, and then we're going to get retail sales and industrial production from China. Now, again, we started with China, so we'll finish with it. Um, it is the world's, I think it is the world's largest economy, but officially the second largest economy, and anything good there is good for the rest of the world. But, of course, those political issues still continue. That's the day I'm looking forward to today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael Wilson. Do you have any questions for him? Uh, Michael, I was just going to ask you about the U.S. Um, 
job subsidy, if you like to call it, and President Donald Trump's executive order. Uh, do you think that this was just being um, over the top? Or do you think that he's put a stop to the stumbling in this back and forth uh, by Congress? I would hope it's the latter, quite honestly. <laughs> and again, I, I maintain this view that if you, if you are a politician and you're going to your voters, they will say, so what did you do in the great debate then? You know, what side were you on? Why, why was all this political wrangling taking place when the economy was being ruined? When our two weeks beyond the date almost, when the, or this all should have been decided, but it hasn't been. And I think that the, I think the, the public, it's not, I think a lot of political commentators look at an election like a horse race. I don't think it's like that at all. I think what'll happen is, that as soon as Labour Day is over, then people will start to really think about the issues as far as the election is concerned. And I, I wouldn't count any um, Joe Biden or Trump um, uh, uh, calculations about what they think's happened about the surveys and all the rest of it. I think that people will actually be looking at this quite closely and saying, what did you actually do? Were you being helpful or were you just being political? So I think these executive orders, of course, they're political because... President Trump's a politician. What good will they do? I don't know. It'll take a long time for anything to trickle down into the economy. But if it is holding their feet closer to the fire, then it can only be seen as a good thing. Yeah. Right. I was, I was listening to Chuck Schumer speak the other night, and he was talking about the fact that they're, they're bridging the gap already in this negotiation, that the Republicans have bumped their up by a, about a billion, that's about two billion, and the Democrats are still holding the line with about 3.5 billion. How soon are they going to reach a deal on this giving? Well, Trump has going to have to sign an executive order. Yeah. I think we're talking trillion, not billion. I mean and, trillion, yeah. Yeah, and, and the fact is that, that both the, that's still two trillion dollars apart, isn't it? Whichever way you feel that they're creeping towards each other. And it's exactly what Nancy Pelosi said last week. She said, we are trillions of dollars away from agreement. And that isn't going to happen in 24 hours. So I think this will probably still continue. And, you know, the sooner something happens, uh, quite honestly, the better. But, you know, we sit on the sidelines, don't we, looking at politicians airing their views, which is <laughs> not, not, not a very pleasant thing to hear. Well, Michael, I noticed that you didn't say anything about commodities this morning. Precious metals, no, oil. No, only because. No, no. I, I, well, only because um, there's there's not a great deal going on. I mean, I told you what oil did last week. It didn't have a bad week. It's slightly off, but I think the variation is so little. If you really want. What I, I think that we should be watching precious metals again this week. Maybe uh, gold will pursue its. Um, pursue and hang on to its level over $2,000 an ounce. We'll see. To be honest, the action has been so little over the weekend, I didn't really think it was worth mentioning. But uh, don't worry, I'll be keeping an eye on it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael Wilson. We'll see you again tomorrow morning. What's okay. next? Yes, it's now time to get updates on the COVID-19 pandemic. And Aaron Akerjala is standing by to do justice to that. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Aaron. Yeah. Good morning to your Desuwa. Good morning to your doctor. Aaron the Bear. It's good to be here. <laughs> and it's good to see you once again. Rafai, good morning. Aaron, you owe me one, you know. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. We certainly will discuss that off screen. <laughs> um, getting straight into it right now. Looking at the statistics that have actually come in right now, as the world is still reeling under the the, under the march of COVID-19, we are getting closer to um, 20 million mark. As a matter of fact, five months since the WHO declared the coronavirus a global pandemic, we've actually seen a major rise in cases. We are getting close to 20 million. And with the, with the, with the virus actually averaging about two, 250,000, we are reporting about 250,000 added cases every single day, which means that well over by tomorrow or later on this evening, we'll be having 20 million confirmed cases. And I must tell you, that's not really good, understanding that it took only six weeks for this number to actually double, which is quite fearful. And we are hoping that things would actually slow down, but things are not just slowing down. We've seen the death rise, which is standing right now, 713. 731,374. We've seen it rise and balloon by 200%. So it's really, really sad. Comparing things from mid-March to this moment, things have been on the rise. But before we talk about how things are unraveling around the world, let's start it off from New Zealand, where there are some good news that are actually coming in. Understanding that when you look at the statistics for New Zealand, New Zealand right now can actually say to themselves that they, they've reported 100, uh, the 101st day, which is today, 
where no recorded community transmission of COVID-19 from an unknown source. The 21 cases in New Zealand were imported into New Zealand by people coming from other countries. And at the moment, they're in the isolation center. And even in the isolation center, no new cases have been recorded. You can actually see the graph for New Zealand there, literally, as it, as it actually took off at a certain time. And they've been able to bring it down to its lowest herb, which is very good news. Unfortunately for them, they are more concerned because that is how the U.S. graph actually looks like, putting it side by side with New Zealand. But unfortunately for those New Zealanders, um, Jacinda Ardis party, remember she's up for election, they are more concerned and, they are, and their polls are actually down right now because they're more concerned that no thanks to the fight, which has been a successful fight of COVID-19, that as a matter of fact, that they might be known to bear the brunt and more taxes will be raised, and more, or rather, taxes will be raised in the country to help to offset the debt of COVID-19. And right now, the people in New Zealand are not happy about that. But if you'd ask me, no, as I said, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And they've actually gone out, ventured on something, and they actually have won the fight, while other countries are yet to actually get a grip of this. Speaking about countries get, getting a grip of this, let's actually turn our attention to the U.S. In North Paulding, the North Paulding High School, this particular video was actually put out by, the, by a young lady, Hannah, and this video literally almost set the U.S. on fire, because remember, we were talking about schools reopening, and they found that in this particular school that some people, including students and teachers, actually uh, have COVID-19. They've actually closed down the school, and they've been disinfecting the school, and they will do that today and tomorrow, and they say later on tomorrow, they will tell, they will probably announce whether or not schools will actually hold on Wednesday upwards. But that is what we are seeing in the U.S. At the moment, it's still... A lot of people have said it's still a bad idea because for things to have, for the economy to open, for schools to open, the rule is this, or the statistics is this. If the test results that are returning back are not below 5%, then schools should not open, churches should not open, even the economy should not open. Places like Texas flouted this particular order, and we are now seeing things actually go out of control in Texas. And same thing there. That was the same thing that Israel also suffered, understanding that Israel, at a certain time, sometime in May, on the 17th of May, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said they could actually, students could actually go back to school after handling the COVID-19 perfectly well. But unfortunately for them, they saw a major relapse. And as a, sec as a matter of fact, they've even entered into the second wave. Some other countries are talking about the second tick in the first wave. Israel are well into the second wave. You can actually see the graph there actually moving. At a certain point, sometime in April, you could see that they, had, they were flattening the curve. And right now, they are really, really, it's got blown out of proportion in Israel. Places like Peru also have actually seen a major rise. Australia also. Uh, they've actually also seen a second wave in Australia. Japan also are uh, also experiencing the second wave. And this is really, really frightful. Putting into context that in the UK, they are still insistent. As a matter of fact, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said it is a national priority to get students back to school. That you will be devoting as much as a billion pounds to ensure that they make up for lost times. And people are beginning to get scared that... If all this, if they are not, if nobody seems to be learning from Israel, what is happening in the U.S. might also happen to the U.K. And with the talk about track and trace the system in the U.K., which is not yet perfected, trust me, they might just have a second wave in their hands. Well, I mean, um, as I've always said on this program, there are lessons that we can learn from all these uh, your jurisdictions that you have cited. Uh, Nigeria already is. Uh, already planning to reopen schools. Yeah. I think in some uh, states, uh, teachers have returned, the students have also resumed. But what we can learn from, from Israel, for example, is that should we see a sudden spike in the number of uh, uh, infections, particularly with teachers and uh, students, I don't think the Nigerian government should hesitate or the state government should hesitate uh, to shut down those schools again. Mm -hmm. However, there are already internationally agreed protocols uh, for the reopening of schools. Uh, which Israel is insisting that it will apply when the students uh, uh, return to classes on September 1. Mm -hmm. uh, between now and then, some of the things they're talking about is that the size of classes will be reduced. Uh, there will be uh, plenty of gap uh, between uh, students uh, sitting in the classes, and they hope that that will work because, uh, according to one of the reports, science says 
younger people are, you know, uh, more likely to have a stronger immunity than older people yes, because sir. they may not have uh, comorbidities. But, I mean, what we've seen, of course, is that, look, we're not just dealing with medicine. We're dealing with something almost unknowable. Yes. But we just hope that the race for uh, getting a vaccine, uh, you know, uh, the expectation that by September, uh, some of the uh, big farmers will have been able to come up with a vaccine. Um, that's the only thing that gives us hope at this particular time, mm. I think. And then in, late, in uh, Nigeria yesterday, some of the uh, churches reopened. Mm -hmm. What did you observe? Um, I must actually say, uh, it, one thing is certain, churches must, we can count on those places to actually keep the social distancing intact. Most protocols were being observed by these religious centers. But where ha what has been drawing a lot of criticism, it has been that particular campaign and the rally that happened in Benin over the course of the weekend. And people are beginning to question because right now the NCDCs are being numb about it. The COVID-19 uh, tax force might come out today and give an excuse for it. We've seen this in time and time again, whereby the political elites have been the ones that have flouted this particular rules, the COVID-19 protocol, while the people themselves, the people that they've been holding to the fire, literally, are the ones keeping these rules, which is rather ironical, if you'd ask me, because I don't think I need to, nobody, will be, nobody will be held accountable for what happened in Benin, which was literally a show of shame. We also saw that also in Ogun State, where, uh, at the burial of Kashamu, these things should not be happening. If we know that prominent figures have passed away, they should ensure that they do something that will keep people away from themselves. Since we know that we can, they cannot help themselves, we should ensure they keep, we keep people away from themselves to help ourselves. Because those were super spreaders, if you'd ask me. All right. I, I just wanted to talk about uh, the money we got uh, yeah. to fight COVID-19. Welcome development. Uh, I, I hope we're going to put it to good use. There's still... Uh, a lot that needs to be done in fighting COVID-19 in Nigeria. But it's a welcome development. It's thank a booster fight. Yeah. Iran, thank you very much. We'll continue tomorrow morning.